G'day guys, today wrapping up part five of our East Coast tour. It's an interview, a live interview in the Adreno Sydney store with Gunther Pringle. The man is a living legend, in the words of another Spiro, um, more than 60 years sending it. Uh, crazy stories about setting powerboat records and competing in international comps and uh, very cool guy, very down to earth, uh, really laid back chat. Uh, thanks to Craig and the team there at the Adreno Sydney store for hosting us. Had an absolute blast and enjoyed a few beers while we talked all things spearing and um, really cool to catch up with all the guys afterwards as well. It was a great turnout with some cool people. Um, before we get there, before we get to this interview with Gunther, a couple of quick shout outs. Go to GoFundMe and go to the Inter-Pacific's uh, spearfishing fundraiser organised by Trevor Kitchen and support the guys. There's five divers trying to go over there to French Polynesia to compete. Uh, really cool guys. Video update there just explaining a bit about what's happening by Trevor Kitchen. Just type in uh, GoFundMe Trevor Kitchen into Google and that should come right up. Otherwise it'll be linked up in today's show notes at noobspearer.com forward slash Gunther. Otherwise next week we have episode 200 which is a huge milestone. Uh, more than 1 million downloads in more than 100 countries um, and 200 episodes to cap it off. Uh, all thanks to you guys. And um, it's just been interviews, frothing interviews with Mad Sparrows from around the planet. I've really enjoyed bringing it to you and um, I hope you guys are still enjoying it as much as you did when we started out eight years ago. But um, if you want to get involved in episode 200, go to noobspero.com, head up into the menu and leave me a nooba story. Uh, what you love about the podcast, something you've learned, you know, the reasons why you listen to it and, and tell your mates about it. The other thought, the sorts of things I want to include in episode 200 and it's a, uh, it's a massive where are they now episode with past guests as well. We, we get to have a good catch up. I've got some voice messages coming in from New Zealand and North Queensland and Melbourne already. It's catching up with some of our former guests, I'm really looking forward to bringing it. But hey, let's get into today's episode brought to you by Patreon Legends at patreon.com forward slash Noobspiro, as well as our Noobspiro partners. Here we go, Gunther Pringle. I can't wait to get into today's episode brought to you with proud partner adreno.com.au. The Noob Spirit Podcast has been partnering with adreno.com.au for more than 100 episodes and these guys are awesome. They have uh, huge spearfishing mega stores all over the country. You can shop online or in store. Use the code NoobSpiro whenever you spend more than $200 and you will automatically save $20. That's right, use the code NoobSpiro online or in store when you spend more than $200 and save $20. Bucks. I love these guys. I remember the first time I brought a spear gun at adreno.com.au down at the Wool and Gabbard store and Adreno have been a huge part of the excitement that I have about spearfishing. Check them out at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpero to save. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it and dive it. Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. Gunther's uh, a Sydney legend, uh, competed all around the world multiple times. And I've been pestered by multiple Sydney divers to get him on the podcast for a long time. 40 years commercial diving, 40 years comp diving, 60 years in the water spearfishing. And uh, I got to see some photos from the, some of the early days where, um, what were you wearing, Gunther? The bloody, uh, I'll, I'll grab that mic if you can. And I don't we'll... know, whatever my mum gave me, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, grab, I'll give that to you. Right. So you were six years old, I saw a photo in your head. Um, you had a mask made out of it. I'm guessing it was an Amaris mask. Yeah, no, it? it was probably an Australian mask. Um, yeah, no, that was from Bundina. The, uh, my father had bought me my first snorkel and goggles when I was six and I straight away, you know, took it on and got in the water. But um, uh, probably wasn't until I was about nine that I actually took on spear fishing you know, yeah, with right. hand spears and, and primitive spear guns. Um, so Bundina was a pretty quiet little town surrounded by water basically and wasn't much else you could do but surf and fish and and uh 
yeah, spearfish. So, so a lot of it's national park these days. Pretty much. Yeah, so you it's, it's you surrounded. were you were privy to some pretty special stuff in that part of the world, I'd imagine. I was born in Germany, but so we came out there. And, um, so my brothers and sisters were born later. Um, mm. So yeah, we've been one of seven, I think you said. One of seven, yeah. So yeah. we've been in the Shire now. What is it now? 60, 65 years. Mm. Do you think so, that early start in the water and just removing some of those? Because sometimes people have a natural aversion of water. I know we've got a bit of a superstition from your birth about what makes you a, a, a water baby. Well, so I'd, I'd that is to... rare. That, that's yeah. something my mother, that's an old folks so Yeah, I, I tell us bo- about it though. Tell us. Um, yeah, so when I was born, I was born with a skin over my head and um, I didn't know anything about this, but the nurse, because I didn't, you know, when you, obviously when you're born and, you, you know, you get a smack on the arse and you, <laughs> and, you, uh, and you wake up and scream, well, I didn't. They call that a medical procedure. Yeah, and so, and so, the, and so the nurse realised that I'd had the skin over my head, and and uh, they, she stuck a hand up over my face and pulled the skin off, and then I, I obviously I could breathe. Yeah. So the wife's tale is that I'd never die or drown. So I'd say, thought, yeah. I thought, well, yeah, that's good. Yeah, because it's, not Cause a it's one, a one in a million odds. I think you told something, me of having your skin like born over. Yeah. yeah, something like that. That's, that's amazing. That's what I got told, but I mean, yeah. you know. And I remember chatting with you and on the And then I got born with another oh. disadvantage. You know, I got born with an extra large toe. So I... I did, I've heard I, about this. I, yeah, so, <laughs> so I had I had that with all my nice. life and got teased yeah. by people all my life and got told that that's why I swim so... F- you know, well, I used to swim so fast because I had this extra large toe. <laughs> but um, What's getting fitted for foot pockets like with extra large toes? Um, the, the, the simplest thing was the that you just... Put a shoe on your right foot, and then I uh, put a shoe on your left foot, and whatever that was, you had to wear on the right foot. Oh right. But generally, I was barefooted. I hardly ever wore shoes when I was a kid. You know, you're living in a beach-sized suburb, so you took off, and you know everything was in the water. You, you gone in the morning and come back at night and surfed and whatever. And, yeah, and awesome. it was it was that bad. You know, at school, I wasn't doing very well at school. My teacher used to send me to pick up the mail on the ferry, mm. and while I was down there in the ferry, I'd be in the water waiting for the ferry to come and give the mail bag and then take it to the school. So so you used a bit of social teasing to yeah, anything, get you further into the water. Anything to get down there and yeah, do all that sort of stuff. Love but um, I didn't really adapt. I didn't really take on competition spearfishing until sort of um, 73. Um, I was mostly surfing. I was yep. riding. Well, so when were you born? Uh, 50, Just so 55. So 18 you started comps? By 17, 18. Yeah, yeah right I, I mean, I was going to clubs in... Six, uh, 1970, I was in a St George scuba club. Um, we used to get taken over there by some young or some fellows from Bundina. They were spear fishermen and they'd sort of introduce you and they'd take you, you know, up and down the coast. But I didn't know if it was a club or whatever. We used to just go spear fishing with them. Um, and then it was sort of uh, 70, 71, I ended up meeting a fellow, uh, friends with Don Swain, who was in the St George Spear Fishing Club. A couple he was, of, shout out to the St George guys, there's a couple yeah, of them here tonight. Yeah, there's a few there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 71, you know, he was trying to, he was taking us up and down the coast as well, and then finally convinced us in 80, 73 to join the St George Spear Fishing Club. Yeah, right. Eh? So, that's sort of where that competition sort of adapted since 73, 74, and surfing sort of phased out a bit, you know what I mean? But One but, thing I'm envious of is the is the spearfishing club culture in Sydney. Like, you guys have got a lot of vibrant clubs down here, it seems yeah. to be. Um, and a lot of good Spearos come from down here. You guys have got a really healthy, regular competition that goes on. I know we, Manny's been a fierce competitor al- alongside you, so... We owe a lot to the spearfishing clubs, we really do. And I mean, um, in my... Se- in Well, just going to another different thing. Um, in St George Spearfishing Club, there was about... 21 divers that left St George Spearfishing Club to go to Tasmania to become abalone divers. Wow. And they were most of them were top divers, um, but they just left to follow their dream of being a commercial diver. So they started from um, 70, uh, sorry, si- yeah, was it? Yeah, 1973. Mm. Um, they were still diving here in New South Wales. They didn't didn't need uh, to pay a lot of money for an abalone license then. Um, but so the first couple of guys took off in '76, and then uh, you know, you know, constantly after mm. that, you know, I didn't get down there till '81. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of divers. that's the year I was born, Gunther. Yeah, well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 81. Yeah, my son was born in 74. <laughs> <laughs> so We're dating my, ourselves my first here. Son, but, but um, yeah, 
a lot of divers went there and we, we just progressed and, and, and followed the lead and, and took it on and we're all fortunate. And, and, and not only just the abalone diving, I mean, a lot of divers, you know, they went across to Broome, um, they became pearl divers, oil rig divers, um, you know, just did whatever they could to get, you know, work. And, and that was the great thing about being in a club. And our club was a I mean, all the clubs are good clubs, but for us, you know, we owed a lot to a fellow called Merv Sheen. Okay. He was the president of our club and he did a lot for a lot of people. Okay. And, um, yeah, and he was sort of, sort of like a father figure to a lot of the young fellas yeah, for right. quite some time. Mm. But, um, yeah, so, you know, once you'd sort of gotten in and you saw the, you know, the excitement and... and, and you know, the friendship and, and then, of course, you know, the, you had a competition between you and your mates and stuff yeah. like that and then, of course, there was always prizes and things like that but, but the adventure was always, you know, something. You've you know, spawned a bunch of questions here. One, one thing for me, Gunther, is I think, and, and I think a lot of Spiros share this, is that, that idea that I love being underwater why not make this a job or a lifestyle? Most of us have toyed with the idea of becoming a commercial diver. I'd love to speak, I know you can speak from the experience of living it. Yeah. What's the reality of being a commercial diver? Well, look, um, you, you, you're moving, well, in my sense, what's happened to me is that I moved away from home and I took a young family and and uh, I was only about 24, 25 years old and you, and you leave all your brothers and sisters and all your family and everything that you've, that you've worked on and your spearfishing club and, mm. and so forth. So to try something that you dream of and, and hope that you succeed and, and in, that, in that side when, when we went down there, it wasn't easy to get into being an abalone, to be an abalone diver. You had to take huge risks and even though the the value of an abalone license then was probably eighty to hundred and ten thousand dollars, a home then was worth seventy thousand and yeah, wow. seventy thousand dollars. That puts it in you context. You had to borrow probably from your parents, which I had to do, and your and mortgage against your parents, my my in laws house. And then as you, many people here would know, you, you can't just go to a bank now and a bank just gives you a loan. It's mm. not the same. But in the in the eighties, you know, if the bank manager thought you were um, of a worthy person and you thought that you were genuine, then they would give you a loan unguaranteed. I think I know how you got the loan. And, and so they gave me $15,000 unguaranteed. And oh, yeah. then the factory that I decided I would sell to, because I'm pretty loyal, um, they said to me, if you sell to us, Gunther, and that we will help you with another $15,000. Oh, wow. And then unfortunately, the licence that I was just about to buy, the diver wanted Ten thousand dollars more than what I'd paid, or what I'd, I'd organised with him, um, because he I didn't have a boat, and so he threw in a boat, uh, oh. and that was hard. Like to do, and so when we got down there, I was there. I, I went down there with a panel van, and two children under under six, and my wife that was there, and then we ended up living in a fish factory for about a year, which was um, rubber mattresses on the floor. Um, no TV, no dining room table, just that for about six months and you could hear the people shucking uh, muscles and that in the back room and that's how you did. And I had to work as a bricklayer down there to just earn a little bit of money um, waiting for that opportunity. And the other stupid thing was that in Tasmania they, they conned everybody that you had to be a resident of Tasmania before you could actually be a diver of ta in Tasmania. Oh, wow. So they told everyone you have to live here for 12 months before we'll allow you to purchase an abalone licence. Mate, which, that's a bold move. Which, which just most people just went, go and get stuffed. I'm mm. not, you know, I'll leave, but but that was the case, and so it wasn't really true, but they had everybody fooled, mm. and so that's what you had to do. So it took me a while, and when I got there, and then, I mean, I, I don't know how much time you got for me to talk about that, but oh, we've got lots but, of time, Gunther. But unfortunately, this is a long when form. I, when I got in the water in the first three months, my father-in-law was a Cro Croatian, thought he knew everything, and wanted <laughs> to be, wanted to be my deckhand, and then oh, wow. maybe in the first couple of months, I think he. He probably would have killed me if it wasn't for spearfishing because the, the, down in Tassie there's a kelp that grows from 20 metres to the surface and, and they tell me that in that area where the, there's a lot of boulders and that's where the abalone are and so my father obviously Sorry, mate. I'll just get threw it out the, the hose and, and I got on the end of it and I went to the bottom and then unfortunately he cut the hose off on the surface and then my air just went like that. Oh, so being a spearfisherman... I instantly threw the weight belt off and I f swum to the surface from 20 metres 
and got to the surface. Now, no, no drama. If you, yeah, I think if you didn't have that spearfishing experience, yeah. um, it could have been you know, the consequences could have been different. And so he didn't do that once; he did it twice. And so that was really hard. So when when I tried to tell my wife that we've got to do something about this, your dad's going to kill me, and I think we've just got to try and get a professional deckhand, otherwise we're not going to do any good. So I got a young fella, about 18 years old, and convinced him to decky for us. He was a lobster deckhand. Mm. So I had him for about a month, and he was a great young fella, hyperactive. <laughs> um, yeah, the mullet, the whole nine yards. But um, we fished a place that we weren't really familiar with, and it was called the Strip, and it was an area on the south west coast. And um, unfortunately... Um, I was at the end of the tether of the hose on the shore and he was near an area where there was a few bombies and and then unfortunately a, a big swell had taken the boat and flipped it upside down and, and landed on top of him and, and of course the air wasn't there anymore and so again I let go of everything, come to the surface, couldn't see anything but white water, got to the shore and uh, looked out to sea and there was my boat upside down and no deckhand. And, in the, and those young guys, I mean, you're talking about 13, maybe 12 degree water temperature in the summer in that month. Mm. And he was in gum boots, which is a no-no, and wet weather gear, and quite cold weather. Yeah. And uh, I just caught him my eye. I could just see him dog paddling over the waves, like just trying to keep afloat. So, um, yeah, so, you know, being a Spiro and in a wetsuit and flins, I swam out to him and grabbed him and brought him in and he was crying and spitting you know, water and getting, you know... As you would. Convulsing and all that. And then, so we were there and it was about 5.30 in the afternoon and, I don't know, maybe a little bit later. And, um, yeah, we were looking... It was looking pretty grim because most of the boats had gone past and we had no way of getting rescued. We were probably about 25 kilometres away from the nearest town by water. Um, And luckily I got him going and we got him to a headland where um, he wasn't quite there but I could see a boat coming from down you know like coming up from the coast Mm. and so I got up on the headland on the on the corner of a where the boat could visually see on top you know like on a high point where you could see a person Um, otherwise you know you got the darkness of the the foreground and the background as they're going past and they don't see you Um, and yeah right last boat and last and they saw me on the corner of the eye and they came over and yelled out and I explained to them what had happened and so I had to then get my deckhand up over the rocks and then had to get him back in the water to get out to the boat. So he was rushed to hospital um, and, yeah, and I was, long story short again, I was uh, taken to court for possible ma- manslaughter had he passed away. Um, obviously, Negligence. Ob- obviously didn't. And the point was of it all was that I was sitting for my coxswain's ticket three days prior to this hap- – uh, I had three days booking – that I was sitting for my coxswain's ticket because I didn't have it. So they were using me as an example to oh. to get it out there with all the old cray fishermen to get their licences. And so they didn't... Uh, so, yeah, anyway, long story short, um, I got taken to court um, for uh, not having a coxswain's ticket and uh, the newspapers read, diver saves... Diver saves... Diver find saving deckhand's life. And in the courts, I remember it... I, they had all the, the government had their barristers and all that, and I just had a solicitor because I couldn't afford anyone at that time, and and I just pleaded guilty and put my hand up. And as the, the they were reading it all out, they're just going, "And how did you do this? And you do that?" And I just you know told them the story, and um, and the, I just remember the secretary just looking up, typing, and going, you know, and so um, I got a two hundred and eighty six dollar fine and told to get my coxswain's ticket, and so everybody that didn't have coxswain's ticket. They used me as an example, ended up getting their coxswain's ticket. So an unfortunate situation, but, you know, again, to do with diving and spearfishing, not having that experience, yeah. you know, helped in that situation as well and so, in many other situations. So in summary, and getting back to my question, you 100% recommend commercial diving for all of us? Oh, uh, only if it's your passion you want to go yeah, there. You right. know, the, it sounds the, like the, you pushed all in, mate. It's a bold move. Yeah. The, the, Did it pay off eventually? It, it did, yeah. It was incredible. I mean, it was incredible. Like, you know, people just, you know, just couldn't believe our situation. Getting into a, an industry where we, within three or four years we were um, on the bones of our ass trying to get in there to actually 
three or four years down the track actually been a millionaire. Yeah, wow. Before I was 30. Oh, that's awesome. But that's, you know, that's... You risked it all. Yeah, but it, that's just the way it went, you know what I mean? But And lots, right and lots, of, lots and lots of things. But, you know, people have done well in all different yeah, forms 100%. of jobs. It was just, it was just an, an interesting um, job, but I never looked at it in that context. I just... Always, and that, and the reason being is I'm still diving today, mm. and I still enjoy abalone diving. Awesome. But you know, it, it, and spearfishing keeps you healthy, and it's a healthy sport. And mm. we, and, you know, we might come back to commercial diving. Yeah, no Albie Cook up there, the Central Coast Sea Lions. He oh, yeah. told me a couple of stories about you. Okay. He said that you set the record for the Sydney to Hobart powerboat record. Yeah, we we did we did that with my son and I were fortunate. We. We had a little bit of money, but we did, at the time things weren't going that well, so we didn't have a real lot of money. But we, you know, we bought a, an old race boat, and we put it together, and we bought an old trailer, and then the Yamaha loaned us some motors. But we, we thought because we've been at sea so long, and, and we knew the coastline, and I've, I mean, I've swum around Tasmania, and I've swum around Victoria, and I've, and I've been across there, and oh. and um, Snoop Sparrow calling. Sorry, you can take it away now. Um, yeah, so. My son and I thought, yeah, we'll give this a crack. And all these people that had very big, powerful, fast boats and, and all, they wanted all the media experience to, as in Stefan and all those sort of guys that tried all that sort of stuff. We thought, we don't, we're not looking for that. We just want to try and do this record. So we, um, yeah, we sort of knuckled it out, just like going on a boat trip to go to, go to work. And, and uh, long story short, we, we achieved about eight, Australian records, I suppose, were just boating, and Sydney to Hobart was the main thing. We yeah. we uh, did that in eighteen hours thirty uh, eighteen hours and thirty six minutes or something. Yeah. Far out. But uh, what's that averaging like? Uh, what sort of speed? Because uh, it's a nasty bit of water at times. Too. About about eighty ninety kilometres an hour. The, the 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 most the most daunting thing in that when we, we well we were we were asked we did a, a there was a thing on Channel Seven we did that and they asked all these questions and we looked like. We looked like people. We really didn't know what we were talking about. But, but the thing that I never ever told them because I, I I never really wanted to tell many people, and it's past now. But when we got to Eden, we filled up with a full load of fuel. I think we put in uh, about seventeen hundred liters of fuel, <laughs> and we got across halfway across Bass Strait, and we hit fog, and fog so thick that you couldn't see in front of you. And you know that there's boats out there, trawlers and all those sort of things, long line boats and everything, and we consistently stayed at 80 to 90 kilometres an hour <laughs> uh, for, the next, for the next two hours. Yeah. And Far anything out. that was in our way was there going to be death or destruction. Death or glory. And, yeah, and so we came out of it. But when they asked us about things that Perfect we had problems on the ocean and things for any... any you know, hiccups and that we just went, yeah. Oh, there was whales out there, and there was, you know, <laughs> and we had to stop, you know, like men do have to stop for a leak, and we had to do this, and and yeah, that's all we said. No near misses in that fog, though. Uh, not in that one, but but, <laughs> but the other one that I went for when I went from Hobart to Melbourne, I set that we set my son and I set that record. We came across Bass Strait and ended up going across at night, and I got vertigo. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know if it's a known thing on a boat, but when you when it's black and you're travelling at 80, 90 kilometres an hour across the ocean and you see nothing and you're looking at a screen that just says that's your point and you're travelling in that direction, um, you uh, you you know I, I th actually thought that I was upside down and I thought we were we yeah. were had problems and my son just looked at me and said what's the matter with you dad you said we're right we're going we're good and I said pull the motors back pull the motors back we're, we're tipping over we're tipping over he said no we're not. And I said, no, we are, and we pulled the motors back. Um, and then I sort of got my vision and I could see a ship in the distance and I could see the lighthouse, um, yeah, so in a distance. And so I thought, yeah, no, we're right, so we kept on going. And, and then, you know, we could, we could feel these um, objects going over the top of our head because we only had this small windscreen and they were gannets and, oh, wow. and birds that you know, obviously are on the surface and we couldn't see them but we were just hoping we weren't going to take too many out so Jeepers, was, that's a big that's a big pretty, windshield wiper yeah gannets, well, you wouldn't want to stick off. your head up I mean you'd, you'd come unstuck but <laughs> but, but um, yeah and there are other little things too that, that happen, but anyway that, that that story could go on for 
Ver- vertigo is something <coughs> I think a lot of Spiros can relate to because underwater, vertigo is something that maybe many of us experience at one time or another. Have you had any nasty encounters with it below uh, the surface? Yeah, like it's, it's like – I don't know where it's cl- a close form of blackout. I, I don't know. Like, you you know, you, not real sure, you know. I've, I've had some – a couple of close experiences, but but um, yeah, I I because I, I, I've never blacked out. I can't really describe it. I've only seen people that have blacked out, and I've seen tragedies in blackouts, but I've but I've not really witnessed. But I've but I've felt very close to uh, you know when you're pushing yourself and and uh, not knowing your limitations. <coughs> Do you get? Like a sense of euphoria when you're when you're on the edge, or what, give give us a sort it's of an a, idea for no, for people that have never experienced coming close. Describe what it feels like in your body. Well, see, it hasn't happened to me a lot over a lot of all the years of diving because I'm pretty tuned. I I, I don't like taking risks. I'm not I'm not known as a deep diver. Mm. I'm 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 sort of cautious in that sense, especially in dirty water. Um, you know, I'm probably capable, of, you know, of diving a reasonable depth, but I, I don't push myself unless I have to. And then I, I really, you've got to know your surroundings and you've got to know your ability, mm. and you've got to know your body. You know, you've got to really understand everything before you, mm. you take those on. You know? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't really say. You know, I, mm. I've seen people black out and that, but I, I have never really felt that euphoria of, mm. you know, because I, I try not to push my push myself that way you know. when you're when you're down on the bottom and you are diving deeper than you like to and you look all the way up at the surface and you're out at the back end of a dive um how do you manage that and how do you know when you're diving too deep especially for for, for new divers and i don't personally i don't think divers in their first two years are at risk i think generally we get a level of competence along with that comes a level of confidence and then there's almost this, we sort of turn off some of that yeah, ability look, to, to judge risk. So how do you do it? Yeah, yeah look, at that question leads into a lot of things that I, I'm for and against in, in, in diving. When you're talking about young kids and that, I, I don't know whether time to explain that. But I, 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 I mean, I know there's two sports in that. I know there's a free diving sport and I know it's a passion for a lot of people and then there's a spearfishing sport and and um, and they they're both different sports and and spearfishing works with free diving but free diving in my sense doesn't work with spearfishing mm. you've got to be a spearfisher first to become a free diver mm. um, a free diver taking that on then wanting to become a spear fisherman um, I don't find that 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 works in hand because mm. free diving is a very um, knowing, knowing, tuning your body, knowing your mental ability, your physical ability, and all that. But spearfishing, you've got to know all those factors as well. Mm. But there's adrenaline attached to spearfishing, and you've got to know where your limitations are. Um, so if you're making a dive, you know, depending on your depth of your dive, you know, you've got to know your own ability. You know, you don't, you don't just keep pushing yourself because um, push yourself if you feel that you've got somebody watching you as a partner of a diver. Um, but, gee, when you're on your own, you, you know, you run a risk and, and no fish is worth your life, you know what I mean? So for me to explain to young, young spear fishermen, Learn spearfishing from the basics, you know. Just get out there, enjoy yourself and, and get to learn, um, just to learn, your, you know, your abilities. Um, your abilities is important. In you shared a story with me uh, uh, just before we, we started recording about some of the scary stuff you've seen. You've seen to, or, or, or been in proximity to divers that have lost their lives. Yeah. Um, yeah talk to me about that, that young guy. Then what happened there? And so walk us through it. We, I met this young fella in 2004 in Peru in the World Champ. Oh, sorry, 1994. So I'm trying to. My, my brain doesn't. <laughs> you're, always, you're losing nine, your decades. 1994. I met this young fella in Peru, and um, he was an exceptional diver. I mean, he was what, 20, uh, 21 years old, um, and he achieved second place in the world championships and uh, he hadn't had a family as yet but I um, came across him uh, of an invitational championship in Easter Island 
Okay. And Easter Island, uh, Chile and quite a few other countries were invited, New Zealand and some of the um, island country, uh, Tahiti and New Caledonia and that were invited to Easter Island for a spearfishing competition. And um, we were invited, three divers and a manager. And, um, yeah, so we uh, went over there and, and uh, competed uh, and unfortunately... Um, we, I knew this young fellow was a deep diver. He was a 30, 35 metre diver, as you know they explained, and and um, and we weren't looking out in that area. We were sort of I was mostly looking in 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 the rocky environment, trying to understand the the, the fish species, and and um, and one of our divers, Mark Searle, was diving out in the 20 metre area, and and. Um, We'd come in because obviously there was something going on uh, that we were told to come in and we got to the main wharf in uh, and um, a boat, police boat or rescue boat had come in, um, whatever boat that they had in a rubber ducky and and uh, they brought the young fella and put him on the concrete deck and they were working on him and they had a, one of the doctors had a very large needle and stabbed it into his, into his heart and they were still working on him and unfortunately he he passed and um, I was always upset with myself because I actually had a camera and I was documenting a bit of our trip and all that and I took the video camera out and I was filming the boat coming in and then you know then I, and I was thinking in my head oh they're going to revive this this young fella and then and then one fella looked at me and I realised what I was doing and yeah, it was wow. just the worst feeling knowing that you were filming somebody that actually just died um, so I, you know, I felt really bad about that. I, it was just not in my head, at, you know, that it happened. But yeah, so he died, and yeah, I'd watched in the freediving when they went to um, uh, the World Freediving Championships in 1998. Um, the boys, see, we were out using my boat training off Bondi in about 50 metres or 45 metres of water, and they were. Uh, I was the uh, safety boat, safety diver. I was down about 22 metres on my hooker, you know, the long hose. Yep. and the, yep. So I was down 22 metres and the boys were practising their diving, going up and down and Pete Watman came down and he did about a 38 metre dive, I think it was, something like that. And he'd blacked out about uh, probably about two metres before he got to the surface. And, and I'd realised what was going on, but I couldn't get to the – I couldn't come up that quick because I was already down there for a bit of time. And so by the time I'd gradually worked my way up, um, he was on the deck and the boys were working on him and they, they revived him. So that was a very close call. Um, Would you call that a controlled environment? It was a, it was a controlled environment because, I mean, there was, there was people in the water watching him dive. Much different I than was, most spearfishing though, isn't it? Yes, yeah. But he was an experienced diver. But you know, And, I mean, that was all new to the boys because this was the first freediving world championships and it was coinciding with my... F- my f- uh, with a world championship in in uh, Croatia in the spearfishing championships, and so I was practicing and you know, they were pr- you know practicing for that as well. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a wasn't a good sight. You know, I mean, just seeing that. And I've you know I've seen others and I've watched one one particular moment is comes up into my mind about a free diver and a spear fisherman. And I it's probably not I don't know if it's right to to talk about. You know the free diving sport because it's a great sport. But again, you you know you have to know your ability. This young fellow in Western Australia we, was leading up to the national championships in Western Australia, and my friend Arnold, who's a he's a forty meter diver, and he was in the free diving world championships as well. We took this young fellow out spearfishing with us, and uh, he was talking about that you know within six to twelve months he was diving thirty five meters and could hold his breath for three minutes, and he just took up spearfishing. And so we took him out and all that, and we were watching him, and we, we, we give him a bit of a heads up about, you know, spearfishing is a little bit different. He's a really excited young fellow, about 18 years old, and and the perfect example that, that he showed was what I've always been worried about, young spearfishermen and learning free diving. He was down about uh, 14, 15 metres, and he'd just been sitting there for, you know, one and a half minutes and just waiting for the Spanish mackerel to pass and, and Arnie had just come up from a dive and we were just watching this young fellow and, and he decided then that there was nothing around so he just started to come up. And as he was coming up from his dive, a Spanish mackerel was going past. And so you'd think that after that that he would just continue to come up 
because he'd already been down there a while. Well, that wasn't what he did. He chased the Spanish mackerel and tried to shoot that Spanish mackerel. And that's the epitome of it. For me, that's what says, um, basically sends out a red light that you've, you've learnt the free diving part but you've forgotten about your ability. You've just your mind's just said, "Well, I'm I'm a, I've learnt free dive. I can dive the 30 metres. And I can hold my breath for three minutes, and I'm going to chase this fish down." And he did, but he didn't do it very long, and he came up flat stick to the surface, and we were watching him. And I explained that to him uh, at the end of that time, and I said, "You know, you, you're lucky we're there with you, and and what you did is something that you really you don't do. You know, you don't come up from a dive." And do you think that's experience, sort <coughs> of? helps us temper and analyse the risk when it comes to performance and we re- and you realise that it doesn't, the performance side of freediving doesn't really have any place in spearfishing. Well, 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 it does if you've been a spear fisherman for quite a while, you know what I mean? Because it, like, like I said, you, you've really got to know your body, you've got to know your physiology, you, you know, you've got to be fit and you've got to know your limits. If you, if you forget your limits, you know, and these, there's, I mean, in the 90s and the early 2000s, there were so many trips in the, in the, uh, going out of Gladstone with young guys. And, and the thing was with those trips, they're all, they've got known divers on there that are, you know, being in competitions and all that and of diving. You know, they talk about how deep they dive and how long they hold their breath for. Well, you know, that's all well and good, but, you know, spearfishing's a hunting. It, it's, it, it's instinct and you've really, as I said, you've got to really know all your boundaries. It's not about trying to compete and, and hit your chest and go, oh, I've just dived deeper than him and I can do this and I can do that. You know, I've listened to all those sort of um, people in world championships and, and, and um, other competitions and how they go on about, you know, that they can do this and do that. And, and I mean, I, I've been told, you know, you won't do any good Gunther going to Europe. You're not a deep enough diver. You, you've got to dive 30, 40, 50 metres. You're not going to do any good there. Um, well, you know, I just went, oh, well, I'll just try, you know, I'll give it a go. And, and my greatest, you know, I, again, I, I don't really talk about, but because I wasn't diving that deep and I, I thought 30 metres was pretty good, but um, I went to Croatia after people said, you're not going to do any good there. And I ran 12th both days in a row and 12th overall in the world. That's pretty impressive. Um, so, um, you know, when people sort of say, oh, you know, when you go, if you're into spearfishing and you're into competition diving, you know, you learn about your species and you learn about the environment where they live and you learn about things and, you um, you know, it, it's not a deep, – deep diving, you get some great fish in deep water and, it, and it's really nice to come up and say that I laid there for one or two minutes on the bottom in 20 metres and this fish came and I finally got – yeah, it's terrific. I, I mean, I, I pour – I applaud all those guys that can do 30, 40 metre dives and that, as long as they know their limits, you know, because there's plenty of guys that have tried to emulate that and died, um, especially in the Coral Sea trips. Today's new Spiro podcast is brought to you by Penetrator Fins, used by leading freedivers and Spiros, including Australian Spiros like Ian Puckeridge, Kate Rogers, uh, the dynamic freediving record holder Ben Eckhart, Hawaii's Justin Lee, Kylie Umeda, as well as Canadian ice diver Magali Coat. Penetrator Fins are praised by proven performers from all over the planet. Have you got yourself a pair? Visit penetratorfins.com, use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on any pair. That's right, go to penetratorfins.com, use the code NoobSpiro, choose yourself a pair of Penetrator Fins and get reliability that you can depend on. Penetratorfins.com. Shrek, my dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many Noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, Noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face Apparel or get a subscription to the world's greatest spearing magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. Equalizing problems can be something that derail you. 
Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the, either the Friends or Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Let's yeah. come back to ego. Let's come back to some of the issues that can happen with safety and stuff like that. I'm really happy to explore that. I want to, let's get into competitions. So, I mean, you started in 1973. A lot of people were passionate comp divers. A lot of people will sit on the fence with it and they're more of a social, let's yeah. feed my family type diver. Yeah. Talk to people about the passion you have for competition diver and, uh, diving and why you think many of us should get involved with it. Um, look, it's like... It's like if you're playing marbles, you know, you, you want to beat your your mate and your, you know. I'd smash Manny at marbles. You know what I mean? I like, it's, 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 it's not just a, it's not a competition, not just a competition. That sounds like a game on, I could win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on levels, you know yeah. what I mean? You, it's, you, you want to compete against your mate who's in the boat, you know, and you want to have, you know, you, you want to have a bit of fun, you know, about all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always liked to, you know, do okay in competitions and stuff like that. But I, I understand why people don't want to get involved in competitions. I understand it, that they just want to do their own thing and, and that. But but you learn a lot from competitions um, because you get to um, come across a lot of competitive divers and you get to see their equipment that they're using and, you and you know, if you dive with a, a diver that's, you know, better than you are, then you get to pick up some of his, um, you know, Skills, he, skills, thoughts, and things like that. Yeah, ideas, that he does. You know what strategies. I mean. But uh, again, it takes time, and and then not only that, you can ask questions. You know, you, you can learn by talking to um, people at the competition, and and then uh, you know, I mean, you might not be up to certain people's levels, but you can get a fish that's as, just as good as a bloke that's been in there for you know competition for 10, 20 years, and you get the excitement of getting that fish that somebody else hasn't got. You know, and and I think every diver's had that. You know, you, you come across young fellas that have only been diving a few years and they've shot a fish that you go, where did you find that? Yeah. You know, like that's a bit of a, an excitement and, and something to talk about. And that that little bit there for a young fellow when he's got a fish that everyone looks at and that he, he gets, you know, he gets excited too. So so he thinks, oh, my, I'm going to do this again, you know, yeah. and, and, and so forth. And, and then the camaraderie, you know, you meet a lot of friends that are life friends. Yeah, a lot of people from around the world have, have, have said kind things about you. Pat Swanson, one of my mates in New Zealand, had nothing but good things to say about you. And, and same with a lot of the experienced divers I've had to say. How do you stay a gentleman in a competitive environment? I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Well, it must be your toes. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I, I remember Paddy. I, I remember him giving me a shirt. It, it was a... Um, I got a, sna a ten and a half kilo snapper, uh, and he called it a. It was a super super snooper, and he had he, super snoop something like that. Yeah, right. And he had it. And okay. He, and, he, and he he took it off his back, and he gave it to me, and he said, "You're the super snooper." <laughs> and I went, "What's a super snooper?" And he said, "Anyone that can get a big enough snapper or something like you yeah. know, like that." So I was quite. Well, he's got the he's, he's, not, he's yeah. got the New Zealand record. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Good on him. And he's, yeah. I think, he's won the New Zealand champs at least a couple of times. So, yeah, yeah. And he, he holds you in very high esteem. So do many divers. Um, let's just say, right, theoretically, for some reason, you get given the incredibly bum stare of taking me out on one of your local comps. Okay. I've never been comp diving before. Um, I'm overweight, middle-aged. You've taken me out. How do you – you're you're my partner for the day. Yep. How do you coach me through that day? What 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 are we talking about and what's our strategy going to be? Okay, well, the, well, before you even get in the water, you, you you have a chat about the gear that you're wearing and, 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 and what you're going to do with it, you know what I mean? Like, you know, whether you're using a hand spear or a spear gun or, or certain fins or, that you, you know, you want to make sure your weight's right, you know, and what – you know, I mean, your wetsuit – is suitable to your 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 there, but the weight is an important factor. So, what do you see wrong consistently with weighting? Um, so, 
Well, there's a, there's there's two things that, are, that I'm big on a certain issue now with weights. But if you're talking about just teaching somebody, that does that's irrelevant to what something else I wanted to talk about. But um, yeah, you look, you just make sure that they're comfortable um, and they're balanced right. You know, I mean, if they don't have a thick wetsuit, well, then, you know, you just say to them, get in the water and, and just, you know, as everyone knows, you exhale. If you sink too quick, well, obviously, you, you've got too much weight on. So that's a pretty known thing with a lot of yep. divers and that. So making sure somebody's comfortable for the start, you know, and then and then making sure that he can actually load his own gun because there's many of people that can't load load the – you give them a gun and they can't load oh, it. Oh, 100%. So you've got to make sure they've got something that they can actually load. I mean, Emmanuel makes guns that not many people can load. He's, all these guns are very powerful. They're Italian. Um, yeah, That's why. yeah. He's, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> We're just going to make fun of you sitting yeah. here, mate. Um, <laughs> but if, <laughs> but I, there's something I, I wouldn't mind hitting on because it's a safety thing for, for people. I've, over the last, I don't know, maybe – 10 to 20 years, I wear two weight belts. Oh, okay. So, and people go, well, why do you do that? Well, I actually wear two weight belts when I'm abalone diving as well. So I wear a shoulder harness, which I carry a knife, and I wear a bottom weight belt, which distributes um, weight over my body. Okay. But spearfishing, that's a little bit different. So I carry the shoulder harness that has a knife where I can grab it, but I carry a bottom weight, which is my weight is the heavier weight. So the shoulder harness is the lightweight, which yep. carries the knife, and it allows me to, in circumstances, to float easier to the surface yep. in trouble. And the, the weight around my waist is the weight that if I'm in trouble, I unclip mm. and I hold in my hand when I'm coming up so that if you black out, you let go of your heaviest weight mm. and then you still have your weight belt and your knife. But you're going to be positively buoyant. Yeah, but you're, yeah, you're positive. So it, it's just something that I've okay. adapted to, but not that it's for the, you know, young kids and all that. So it's yeah. for, I sort of find that something that would be good for young guys that dive deep and, you know, spend a lot of time in the water. That's something that, you know, in your head, if you, you have to know in your head that if you are, are at your limits with something, and you usually know at your limits when you go, shit, I think I've gone down too far or, I, I'm, you know, I'm feeling it and I've got to get to the surface. Mm. It's the first thing you do is to grab your weight belt. And hold it out in your and hand. Ho- well, just hold it so yeah. that it, it's unbuckled. Yep. I mean, you can always bring it to the surface, but if you black out, you've let it go. Now, it's I, a great I mean, habit that so many of us don't do, though, but it's, it's yeah, a really good I, I don't think I'm the first person to talk about that. I mean, no, there must not, be lots but, of people that talk about yeah. that, but, but – but, that's the dual system weight belt that I wear. But mine's mostly because I like the knife against my chest. Mm. I don't like – knives shouldn't be on the legs. Yep. You should never wear a knife on the leg. Some people talk about that triangle. So it should yeah. be – your knife yeah. should be accessible to both hands and yeah. that's sort of that triangle of your body. Is that something you sort of think about? Um, yeah, look, I don't like knives on, on belts because they get caught, yeah. especially if you're blue water hunting. You don't want anything that when that when that line shoots past you, you don't want anything that it can attach to your to your weight to you well to you, on your leg or your or your hip. You want the knife. I mean, for me, it's here in the centre, so it's not going to get caught, and it's easy access to get to cut a rope or, in my case, I usually stab a lot of fish um, that way. So le- <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's just say I've got my weighting right. You've taught me how to load a – well, I already know how to load a spear gun. Let's just say I already know how to do that. Yeah. Most of my gear is looking decent and fairly used. Yep. Let's just – what? where to from here? Um, yeah, so if you're a new person and that, I mean, I've I mean, I've done that a few times, just swim with you and just and, – but I've generally before we go diving, I just generally give people a heads up, you know. Just take your time, relax, you know, get your body weight right. You know, make sure your goggles are clear that they don't get fogged up, which is a lot of people just tend to get their goggles fogged up. Um, yeah, just get yourself that you feel comfortable in the water. Once you're comfortable, then you can learn all the little, you know, the slow little tricks, you know what I mean? So, you know, and that just, all those little tricks come with experience, you know, the stalking, you know, going the opposite way to where the fish is and coming back, you know, along the bottom and all those sort of things. You, you, all those things come with experience and time, but generally being comfortable in the water. That's really the most important thing for, I feel, for a new diver, you know, he's, and then and then uh, spend a lot more time just just practising, you know. What's your strategy and, with a score sheet? 
So a lot of people say, like I've, I've chatted with a few different people and there's a lot of different ways to approach different competitions. Your local comps here are you. Some people say just shoot all the easy stuff first and then move your way out. And other people say go out and make sure you head in the, if it's a swimming comp, head in another direction. Yeah. Um, scouting, all of these sorts of strategies. To yeah. Give us a, an overview of a couple of, of, I, of effective strategies. Well, I tend to leave all the easy fish to last. I, I don't, I mean... When I say easy fish, fish that are the, the most common fish in the water. Um, so um, obviously if you're coming across a, a good environment where there's quite a few species of fish, you'll take out the fish that are the harder of the species to get. You know, I mean, if you're talking about a moong, like you've got a blue moong, a bandit moong and a red moong. Mm. Well, the first one you, I mean, most people know is you take the blue moong because he's not, he doesn't hang around, he just swims and then if you miss him, he'll, he'll just go off in direction. A red moong will just go into a cave and a bandit moong will go in and then come back out again and they just hang around, you know what I mean? Um, and I said to Manuel, if you're going for the, the black fish species like a drummer or a, a ludric or a zebra fish, will you take the zebra fish first and then you then you take the ludric and then the drummer because he'll go into a cave you know what I mean you you learn those species um and, and their environment their habitat and then you work it out but it, but if there's a you know like a pelagic fish in the area you see that before you see those fish well then you'll go the pelagic because you know like a trevally or a salmon or a tailor or you know you always go the pelagic before you 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 know take any bottom dwellers unless it's a king wrasse or it's something that you don't see too much of boar fish you know you, you you'll you'll look at it it's generally knowing your species and knowing um what they're about yep. so yep. It, you know they all act differently mm. and some don't hang around long at all so you're looking for a workup and aggregation and obvious point of structure and then you get multiple <coughs> species in the same space and you're shooting them basically in the order they spook. Yeah. So the most spooky first, fish first and then you're working your way sort of backwards from there. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of it's to do with the amount of divers in the water. So if you've come across a, 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 an area where you're on a headland and there's a few pinnacles, well, well you'd, you'd go straight up to the pinnacles straight away where the bait is, you know what I mean? Because you can come back into the shore and so forth because... When you get out there, someone's either going to, you know, come along and, and, and get there before you. So you generally, you know, for pelagic fish, you're, you're looking for, um, you know, the food source. And so, yeah, you work on that and, you, you you know, you try to get whatever of those pelagic and fish that are in that area and and then you start working your way around. But but you get an idea of how you're travelling in a competition, um, you know, in, in your time frame. And, and your location. So, you know, some people travel a long way, some people travel short distance, and some people have already got their habitat or their areas marked out, so they'll, they'll, um, they'll travel to the areas where they think they're important Mm. values of fish are first and then and then unfortunately I mean everybody's doing the same thing so then you're you're over going over other people's um, you know areas and that so obviously the the wide deep divers are you know benef benefit from you know the, the lesser amount of people diving mm. but then if you know the environment then you've always got you know the habitat you, you you've always got um, you know fish that are caved up and then you can work and and, and do that and generally you know you, you you know you open your lungs up and it, it can work works the opposite way I, I generally go in you know into the mediocre water chase up a few fish get my lungs open and then work my way out okay um because I, I just need time to open my lungs up some people the dive response can come in a little bit slower as well i mean i know we're borrowing from free diving ideas here but um yeah, whereas free diving, sometimes they say to do your, your highest performing diving at the start of the day. Most Spiros seem to work up to their, their better diving and then taper off if they're smart. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, at it. Every, everybody's different, you know what I mean? I mean, some people are capable of just, just jumping in the water and diving 20, 30 metres straight off the bat, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, look, at every, each into their own, you know what I mean? I mean, it's... Um, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen divers in the competitions that dive 30, 40, 50 metres and, and get not one fish. You know what's what I mean? The funniest, but, what's the funniest thing you've seen in the comp? Oh. oh. Obviously, Code Browns are, are, are... I don't know if you know, Gunther, but uh, it's a kind of a favourite of mine. Aqua bogs, whatever you want to call them, taking a poo out in the open ocean just seems to delight me. Have you got any funny poo stories or... I'm uh, happy to go either way on this, but it's... yeah. 
plenty of stories. I'm fairly yeah, immature. Oh, look, but... some, some of them I, oh, I couldn't really say. I mean, there's no ladies in there. <laughs> no. The, the, the worst no one, ladies. The worst one, we had a, a, a young lady in the boat and um, <laughs> and, and we, were spear, we were fishing and, and <laughs> we're coming back to the boat and coming off the bottom and obviously the deckhand had to um, – sort of keep his eyes focused on the front because she was in the doorway because I have a door in my boat, um, having a leak out the door of the boat and, you know, coming up from the bottom. Firstly, <laughs> firstly the first thing you saw, well, that was, I mean, that yeah. that was an, a thing there. But, but yeah, plenty of, plenty, plenty of um, swimming into other people's... Um, Burly. Yeah, all that yeah. sort of stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, have you done it to someone on purpose? <laughs> No, I haven't really done that. I'm, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more discreet on, on that. I, you know, is that why you still dive with Manny? He hasn't done it to you. Yeah, either. no, I'm, yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't done anything like that. But like, not that I can remember. Not that my my memory banks is. We've got you know. a story here from Manny, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, to, talking about like one thing with all spearfishing is it's as much about the people you go diving with as it is about the actual spearfishing. Talk about some of the fantastic people and what you think makes a good dive buddy and good dive crew. Oh, look, and that again depends on where you're going. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're just going general spearfishing or you're going blue water hunting, um, you know what I mean? Like blue water hunting, everybody wants to get in the water first around a fad. Um, everyone wants to get in the water, you know, if there's bluefin tuna on the line. So you want to go away with a... With a a group of guys that are considerate, you know, that wait their turn and, and you know, if you get a fish, you get in the boat and then you drive the boat and all that sort of thing. I mean, everyone wants to get, a you know, a nice fish, but I, I just think it's just, you know, good to go away with a good bunch of guys that are, you know, that, um, yeah, that, that, that you get along with well and, and uh, have similar interests and stuff like that. And in spearfishing, yeah, look, I mean, I, I've, I've had a fish many a comp with just – you know, anchoring the boat and that, and and the only reason I actually use a deckhand now is because of my age, and I'm more worried about you know people getting run over and that, and and uh, and, and in this day and age, it's quite scary. Um, there are a lot of young people up and down this coastline that don't have floats. That worries me a lot. You know, young guys that just go out spearfishing, um, you know, and they're with their friends. But um, you know, I've been out many a time with my friends and and travel along the coastline and see guys diving um with with little milk bottle floats and un- and i mean i i understand young fellas you know can't On afford a it but but i just wish that you know that they would someone would tell them that you have to have a float that's seen because you know the jet skis the way they travel so fast and other things it's just it's just so important you know i i, I really worry about that with, with the young fellas and and that so it's yeah. So you're a float and flag man, absolutely to this day. Absolutely, yep. yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't do anything different. I know there's a lot of guys that you use real guns. Yep. Um, that's all well and good along the shoreline, and and if you've got you know you can swim to the shoreline easy and and, and that and, but again, unless you're carrying a float, the, the boatman doesn't know where you are, and neither does anybody else. Mm-hmm. So, real guns, real guns are probably okay if you, you know. You, you're sort of on the reef and the dive and the f- mat, uh, the boat's following you close by, mm. but if you're blue water hunting, whole different ball game. Oh, you know what I mean? Because yeah. one bloke gets a fish and he goes that direction, the other one goes that direction, and and if you've got sloppy conditions, it's it's deadly. It's it's really a no no. I, I don't like real guns that people um, without some sort of attachment, whether you've got the line attached to your weight belt or you attached to something, but you've got to know where your divers are because it's you know your life's at stake. Mm. So it's 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 an easy way of spearfishing, especially in the reef. If you want to chase, you know, um, tusk fish and stuff like that, and you're in the you know ten twenty foot mark, and you're, you're chasing them up and down everywhere, and you don't want to have you know a float behind you. But but if you're blue water hunting, definitely not a real gun, you know, unless you've got a float. Cool, so, good points. What's your rig? What's your what's your gear from? Uh, sort of my gear's tone? hopeless. I, I don't. I've never been a real good rig gear person. I. I Tanny did say that. He said you were shit with it. Yeah, me. I'm hopeless. I'm the worst, I think. <laughs> I've always, you know, I've had, you know, Ted Lau in the 90s used to look after me and I'd always go, Ted, I can't go on this trip unless you fix my gear, mate, I'll do this. <laughs> and Manuel's been my last 20 years. He's, he's looked after me. So I've just never been good at, at 
gear and that. I've you know I've always so I've what, always paid for it and got it right, but I've just never never um, I'm hopeless. I can make prangers because I'm an old I'm the old system. I'm not real good with the. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of the guns that are in this room. I'm. You're not I'm a, a flopper I'm a, man. You're a I'm pranger a flop, man. I'm a pranger man. Yeah. yeah. So every why? F- why? Give me the rundown. Uh, habit. Okay. Habit. Since I was, you know, I suppose with a pranger on the end of a hand spear, and and then with a pranger, old Merv Sheen. You know, everything was prangers in the seventies and eighties. We learnt that way, and we just no one's changed. And and you know, I mean, there's not a fit. I'm bragging now. There's not a fish I haven't shot without a pranger. I mean, yep. and most fish that I, when I use the guns, and even manual makes good guns, but I'm hopeless with them. I just yeah. cannot, you know, I, I just, for some reason, I'm no good, you know. Prangers, go, go, Manny. I've seen Gunther actually shoot, uh, was it a 60 kilo dog two with a pranger? Yeah. 60 or 66. 60 That was pretty kilo. amazing. And a 55 and a well, yeah. uh, with prangers, yeah. yeah. So prangers, arguably, I, there's a few of you Sydney guys that are famous for going north with, with prangers, by the way. It's, it's quite a well-known phenomenon, particularly among the older cohort. Yeah. Um, what can go wrong when you use a pranger? What, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, well, if you don't hit a vital organ, if you're talking about a big fish, if you don't hit a vital organ, you're generally going to lose your fish. Um, it's very hard to hold on to a fish. Um, if you don't hit, hit structure. But with a pranger, I mean, I the dogtooth tuner that I've shot in the Coral Sea, I, I actually made an extendable pranger, a pranger that's quite like a 12-inch pranger. Wow. And I use that with, you know, with a gun with powerful rubbles and and I've managed to stone um, the dogtooth tuner and another tuner I hit in the gill plate and it wasn't going to come out. Um, so I just wore it down, um, but uh, yeah, and, and other you know other tarim and all those other fish. I mean, they're pretty powerful fish. But you manage if you can't hit them in, in a, a vital area, then you're you know you're not going to land the fish. And generally, they get away, you know, whether they survive or not. But but um, the good thing about a pranger is when you're targeting big fish, is that the pranger starts off like a gun starts off a small hole and ends up going in and then, you know, holding on or hitting a vital organ. So that's been that's been good for me, you yeah. know, and, and I've most of my fish, most of the big fish that I've landed, I've been lucky enough to stone because of that system, mm. Wahoo, Spanish, um, all those type of things because the pranga, even the Maori wrasse I stoned and this is not, Something that we talk about today, <laughs> but but I've found on these days a 60, 68, 67 or 68 kilo Maori ras, wow. 68 kilo, and I hit it front on just up below the knot. Not now, that's the first and last one I ever shot, but I got condemned over that um, because it was used in a book that I think Adam's done, and they and I think it was just a photograph and the whole thing, but it was my first and last time I'd ever shot one, and and it was was that and and I think the other reason why I was sort of devastated with the shooting of that fish is what that it was left on the deck of the boat and it was left in the sun and then thrown over at the end of the day because they never filled it. Oh, so wow. I said I'll never shoot one of those again. Yeah, that's disappointing. Yeah, but that pranger was the ultimate. I mean, you you know as you know if you don't shoot a fish right with a straight spear, it doesn't matter whether it's a dog tooth or anything, you're going to lose your spear. Sometimes your gear. Um, the pranger, for some reason, seems if you goes to you know the bottom, I, I, it's either I've lost my spear, but I've I've still got my gun. Um, I suppose that happens in other cases with, with straight throughs, but it's it's just me. I, I've only used prangers. Um, Shot placement, um, big fish, small fish, everything with a pranger. You're always aiming for structure. Or are you still doing lateral line going for this? Yeah, I, I, I generally aim for structure and that. I, I, I generally, you, you know, I mean, Jewfish, Mulloway, I used to be able to get them pretty much and stone them most of the time because I'd, I'd always, with a prang, if you hit them anywhere on the top of the head, you know, in that frontal part, you generally stone them. If you hit them on the side, you, you have a bit of a problem. And, you know, it's, it's the frontal top where the eyes are. I was lucky enough where, again, I didn't have a pranger. And it was only a one time that I used a straight through, and I got a tuna in New Zealand, and that, no and that was hit so, the, like a, that hit the right spot. So that 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 was a lucky shot. Um, it wasn't, you know, you, you aim, but it was lucky because, you know, 
to stone something that big and that with a you know a flopper gun. It's you know mm. it's pretty pretty lucky. Yeah. But I, I you know I would have used a pranger if I'd have had a pranger gun out there, <laughs> which, which probably was, which sounds ridiculous. But but anyway, it's, it's just, a big bluefin. You, you went and targeted. Yeah, yeah. I I went with Herbie and his family, his boys, and a few other people, and it was a long discussion about how to go about going over there because we'd heard other divers had gone over there to do that, and and Herbie, as you might know, Herb, he's a an urchin diver and an abalone diver and a spear fisherman, competitive spear fisherman. His son, very Graham. competitive, and and I I talked about it with Herbie about one day going out off Greymouth to try and shoot one of these tuna, and he said he'd like to do that too. So. His, his son and a few other people weren't that interested. They just want to come along and film. And, and uh, we went out. I flew over there. I didn't have a lot of gear. They loaned me the gun and that. But I flew over there and, and uh, we went out on the first day. And uh, fortunate enough for Herbie, he got his big tuna. And it was a great achievement. It was, you know, it was a highlight of that, that period. We thought that was it. Um, and the next day, you know, he said, you want to have, you know, it was your turn, have a go. And... And this was the only last day, and and uh, we, he put me alongside one of these Russian ships out there, and I jumped in the water um, and swam down the side of the ship, and of course I saw nothing. And then we went up to another ship, and then the captain of the ship had told us to vacate and get out of our, our, our area. And Russia asked us what we were doing, and uh, we just said we just want to shoot a tuna behind your boat. He said no, no, no. Anyway, long story short, we had the last chance, which was the last New Zealand boat, I think, um, about three o'clock in the afternoon and we jumped in and um, the boys had swum towards the boat. They'd saw a few fish, they were filming and I was watching the hokey, which they use w w when you the trawlers are catching hokey and, and the nets are bringing them up to the back of the boat and so when they bring it in, this all loose hokey floating from the back of the boat. Um, so I was just watching this little piece of hokey just simmering down, you know, 10, 15 so metres, just kept on going. And I sort of went down because I saw a tuna and then I thought, oh, no, it's going the wrong direction. So I came to the surface and then thought, oh, that's it. And then I thought, no, I'll just keep following that fish. So I just went down and followed the fish. And as I, I looked to the corner of my eye, there was a tuna coming up towards the hokey. And I inter lucky enough to intercept it in about 15, 17 maybe metres. And, um, yeah, and there was – I didn't realise the young Herb was behind me with a camera and uh, – Oh, so they captured all that for you? Captured – yeah, they captured yeah. it. And so, and so it just – yeah, and it just keeled over. And when I got to the surface, Herbie just looked at me and said, you know, the float wasn't going 500 miles an hour or whatever. And he's, he said, what happened? I said, I think I stoned it. And he went – he looked at me and went, bullshit. And I went, yeah, no, I think I did. So then he said – to me, you're going to have to go down now because it was already at the end of a tether in 25 metres of water at the end of the bungee, at the end of the, the gun or 20-something metres, whatever. And he said, you've got to go down now and put another shot in its head because if you pull it up, you could lose it. And I thought, you've got to be kidding. My heart's running at 5,000 miles an hour and you're telling me to go back down there in 20-plus metres of water to put a shot into its head. Anyway, I had, had to do that. So, yeah, we got... Uh, no, it was another gun they loaned me. So, so, um, so yeah, it took us a long while to get it to the surface. But he was more worried about sharks, you know, out out there. And the water got really dirty because of the ship. Uh, you know, the water changed colour and that. Um, and you know, we were in that two thousand metres of water, and and um, which most free divers would get out into that sort of de depths. And and uh, yeah, finally got it got it onto the boat and. Yeah, and took it into shore, so a lucky, a lucky day. Gunther, that footage I've seen it. It's actually on YouTube, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's got like many views. I, I don't mean, know. I, close, haven't, I haven't seen. I think it ten more. years ago I had five hundred thousand views. Now it's close to over a million. And yeah, I don't know. I'd... It's one of the best footage I've actually seen. And the fish went. What did he go? I remember, but I like you. Uh, saw the weight. Two hundred eighty-two kilos. Yeah, so it's an amazing fish. <laughs> yeah. So back. Back to you, Shrek. But yeah, well, I mean, it was a lucky shot. It just uh, you can't, you can't say I planned it. It was a lucky shot. When luck and skill meet, luck and opportunity. Yeah, is it? Uh, when look, skill and opportunity meet, you know. Yeah, yeah luck, lucky shot. But but you know, the boys were terrific. I mean, what they did and and, and get over there and and um, and then the, a lot of people said, you know, what do you do with a fish and and 
they, you know, I just said, look, the, the boys brought it in, they weighed it, they, they, the, the co-op cut it up and there was many people around and they just gave as many people fish, yeah. you know, as they could and then the boys took the rest home. I couldn't take anything home, so, <laughs> that, you know, I don't know whether you've got time for that, but that leads to a really interesting story. Because Go for it. I, I left in the afternoon to get a midnight flight or flight from Christchurch back to Australia. We just, I had a hire car. Mm. And so I left there, said goodbye to everybody and, you know, did my thing and had my bag and my small gear and they, they had the guns. So I'm going through, I, I don't know if many people know about that area there, but you're in hilly mountains and it's raining and it's horrible roads. And so I got over the mountains and then down to the flatlands and heading back to Christchurch and I came around a bend and right in front of me was this bull that looked like about a ton and he had massive horns and he was right in front of me yeah. and I had nowhere to go. And I thought, I'm done for. Like, I'm just going to run straight into this bloody thing and, and it's curved and it just moved a little bit. And and I thought to myself, here I am going out there shooting what I thought is a bull in the water and I'm coming around a bloody corner and here's a friggin' bull in the <laughs> middle of the road at 8 o'clock at night. And I thought, my God, you know. So, yeah, it was a... Something I, you know, I still something to remember. I still haven't figured out why Australians call tuna tuna. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, I don't know. It's a weird one. I'm still trying to get my head around. Yeah. I mean, we butcher heaps of stuff like beer and beer. Like, there's no difference yeah. in the Kiwi language. But anyway, the cultural idiosyncrasies. You enjoy diving with the Kiwis? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, we're all we're all the same. You know, Aussies and New Zealanders. I mean, we're all the same. Well, Kiwis are just a little bit better, I think. Yeah. They. they, 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 they they generally – they've got a bit of pranksters in them, but they're generally good blokes. Like they're just – you know, I've had a f- – you know, quite a few times where I've caught up with them in New Zealand and over here and that and, yeah, they're all – and they're always – they're competitive. Yeah. And, and as we all are competitive yeah. and, you know, give you a bit of flack at the end of it, you know, and, and if you lose, they still give you a bit of flack. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Killshot spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Killshot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. When you're starting to spearfish, there are a number of obstacles, and some of them are financial. Doing a freediving course is something that I've always recommended on this podcast. If you can do a freediving course with a Spearow, even better. But some of us can't even afford that. I've got good news for you. Today, you can do a freediving safety course for free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. This course is brought to you by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. He's got a passion for helping Spiros to die safer, smarter, and have more fun as well. This freediving safety course is practical and it's free. Check it out at freedivingsafety.com or go to noobspiro.com forward slash Ted and you'll find it there as well. Again, it's a free course, just teaching you the basics of freedive spearfishing safety. Check it out, noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. I've got a, uh, two things I want to ask you about. One's a sort of a faster pace round of questions that we'll finish on. The last real question I have, because we just don't have time for everything, Gunther, I could pick uh, your brain forever, mate. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you about Greece, because Greece was arguably one of the deepest, craziest spearfishing competitions that um, that we've ever had. And it I, was, I know, I yeah. know you finished pretty well, yeah. and uh, I'd love to hear some stories and tales from that, um, just keeping in mind that we're... We are stretching the time a wee bit. Yeah. No, look, again, it's another, it was another place where you're going, you've got to be kidding. Even Herbie said to me when I got there, he said, what are you doing here? And he said, you can't dive 40 metres. You need, you can't get fish unless you can dive 40 metres. And again, I just said to Herbie, I said, I'll just, I'll find them. I'll just find something. You know, I'm just here to enjoy it. You know, the, the, the real good guys couldn't come, you know. I mean, a lot of other guys... <laughs> What other other guys that dive deep and that I said for example you know they weren't they weren't able to come and I said we did all right you know we got our places in the Australian Championships but we weren't right up at the top you know the top few but we still we still sort of earned our right to go over there because we entered an Australian Championship to go but 
you know, no one else was going and, and, and of course, we, you know, we made an effort to go and we thought there was a chance. And, I mean, I know Emmanuel and, and um, Graham are capable divers. They can dive, you know, 30 to 40 metres and, and um, yeah. So my strategy there was just to try and stay fit and to focus on, the envir- on, on what I see on the bottom. Mm. And this is what most spear fishermen, when you, you learn – in wherever you dive, just learn the habitat and learn the way the fish act in that habitat. And so when I got there and we did a bit of reconnaissance, I mean, we could see fish in, you know, 30, 40 metres, you know, when you're, you know, and looking and doing your reconnaissance. But I knew that takes up a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I knew that there were divers and generally getting the talk about a lot of divers that, you know, they'll only get a certain amount of fish. And there was already um, talk of people blacking out and, and, and struggling. And I thought, you know, this is something that's not for me, but it's risky. But the boys are capable and they want to have a go. But if you want to do well as a team or an individual and you've got to, you know, you've got to work to your ability. And in spearfishing, whenever, if it's a competition, you've got to go to your, not only to your ability, but where you think you can get fish. So when I got there, I... I mean, I saw fish in lots of different areas. We did a lot of reconnaissance in, in areas where you could spear fish and that. But I seen certain species that I thought um, were, uh, for, for me, that I could target. And um, there were other species. I did see cod and I did see the, a couple other species. But, you know, and, and learning tactics from hunting cods and fish from in Australia, I had my plan of where I'd seen certain species of fish but I knew that you know that takes time and so I tried to give more time to there was a fish they had a parrot fish there and it was um, not I think in in the time for 20 years they weren't that dominant in Greece but but they became more prominent in in time and I thought you know they're pretty cunning but I watch them and, you and, and you know, like most parrotfish, they, they, they follow you, they watch you, they travel ahead of you. But somewhere along the line, if you find them, they're going to find their home and they're going to go into their cave. And that's when you watch them. Because a parrotfish, when he goes in a cave, he, there's always another entrance he's going to come out. And he's, before he comes out, he'll have a look just to see if you're there. And you've got to work out where his entrance is and where the exit is, you know, it might be leaning up against another wa- rock or it might be leaning down towards the sand. So it's an obvious. It's gone in that way. It's going to come out that way. You know, I watched all that and and, and, and so I took on board that along with all the other species. Um, I had my chances with cod. As I, as, as I said, you, I knew where one was and I knew how to approach it. I knew not to come over. It was always on a plateau and I'd seen him for... I'd seen him twice and I knew that I wasn't going to come over the top and then come down. I was going to come around the side and come quick because as soon as they see you, they're off. And he was about two kilos, which was about the weight for one of those cod. But I lost my opportunity. I, I just didn't, you know, he, he'd gone too quick for me to make that decision. And I'd also had a, a larger cod in about 20 metres um, and it was in a cave and I'd spent a lot of time and I knew time was, was something that you can't, if you want to get a fish in a competition, you can't keep persisting um, those fish, they, once they go in there, you know, it's very rare they're going to come out and look at you, not like, you know, in our fish in Australia. We've all spent two hours on one oh, yeah. fish too that just continues to disappoint you. Yeah, so it did. I, I get what you're saying. So I was fortunate enough, I got a parrotfish on the first day and I got a parrotfish on the second day. And the second day when I got the parrotfish, which was, which was exciting for me because I got a, a European record and the waymaster, he gave me this. Took oh, this off. Yeah. He took this off his neck and he put it and he gave it to me and said, I want to give you this. So I was chuffed. Yeah, know, I wicked. Thought, and, you know, I suppose the other thing was too, I was 60 years old. Representing Australia in rep- one of the deepest spearfishing competitions of all time. Yeah, and we and were if- lucky to get we, – we, you know, we got some fish. I mean, Manuel and, and that were unfortunate. You know, Manuel said to me after he said he should have targeted some fish um, and not – you know, it's hard to let the glory fish go because they're out there, mm. but it but it's so hard to get. I mean, as you know, the, the, the top diver in New Zealand, he got one fish, mm. and he got that in sixty meters of water. Yeah, yeah. sixty meters. Is that like Dave Mullins. Can you? Yeah. 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 So it gives you an idea. Yeah. And, and and the previous world champion and the the world champion, the next following in, yeah. he never weighed one fish for two days. Oh, yeah. 
So to yeah. give you an idea of how car- – it was a tough competition and hard, but again, I was – I suppose I was lucky because I just spent time – looking from 20 metres to the shallows and just working the structure and working the fish out. There were mullet there, but it was hard to get a mullet to weigh and I did have my opportunities. Yeah. But, you know, I, I knew of that. I knew of the mullet and the parrotfish and a couple other little fish. But, you know, and there was the uh, moray eel and, and you had to try and burly, but they weren't like our fish. They weren't coming out. They Manny made a note about you about... <coughs> just being one of those blokes that knows how to hunt appropriately in the shallows. A lot of guys just... There's a race to deeper water. Oh, I'm going to go where my diveability lets me go. Yeah. But the art of learning how to do stuff in the shallows, like you've got to be super quiet on the surface when you're hunting in the shallows. It's arguably sometimes a harder discipline. Have you got any comments on that? It it is, but generally I I look ahead. Um, If I can see a certain species and 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 I know how they act, I approach them differently. So some fish will, you know, he'll start to move and you follow mm. and then they might go into a cave or they might go around a, a bit of a headland or mm. like a bit of an underground mountain and then you know that they're going that direction. So you cut them off at the pass or you, um, you know, you, you, you lay on the bottom. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are different fish and different methods of approach. Love it. Um, yeah, so... Time in the water? Sorry? Time in the water is the main um, teacher? You've got to be... Yeah, a- time, yeah, time in the water, but just it's just just look at, at, at the environment where you're diving and just watch the fish, you know? To be a good just comp learn- diver, how many days of the year do you need to be in the water? Oh, you can't ask me that because I don't, I don't spend many days in the water anymore. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we were, we were, you know, I'm in the 70s and 80s. We were fishing most competitions. Um, we were wherever we could. Um, and we were social diving, you know, friends and doing, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, look, it's just a matter of it, – it's time, you know. But yeah. you just get out there and, and you try to be um, – main thing is with, you, with a, group of, a group of friends or just one friend. It's not good going out there on your own. That's, mm. that's not a good habit, no. you know, diving by yourself. You know, you've, you've – not today's environment anyway. I mean, you know, there's a bit of a shark issue out here at the moment and that, so we – Let's get into that. Um – we're going to go to audience Q&A in a sec. I'll ask you a couple of quick questions and then we might open the, uh, the shitstorm of sharks. Um, who's the best person to go diving with for you personally? Name and shame. And why? Why do you like diving with them? I, I know Manny's here, so it's a bit awkward, but well, you can name a non-Italian there's, there's, there's Kiwi many, diver. There's many, there's many people I've dived with and, and spent time with over the years. Um, like... I mean, I spent a fair bit of time with Emmanuel. We've been away a, a fair bit, and we enjoy each other's company. And 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 um, you know, and I've got a an elderly. F- oh, I say elderly. I've got a guy who's a year older than me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and him and I are mates, and we yeah. just I enjoy going in competitions with him because we just you know it's for the social part, and and we don't care where we come. We don't. We just. Do our thing. We went overseas to a freshwater spearfishing competition. Yeah, as two older guys, and we we had fun together. The freshwater worlds, or in freshwater New worlds. Oh, yeah. yeah, we had fun together. Yeah. We enjoyed it. You know, what awesome. I mean, that's just what it's about. Just camaraderie. I've heard those comps are fun. It's fun. Yeah, if you can get there, it's fun. But um, look, that many people. I mean, I, I my partner. I just I'm going to the nationals in the end of the month with a friend from Western Australia, mm. um, Arnold Bacoli. He's, you know, I've dived with Arnold over a lot of years and he's an abalone diver as well and we've been friends and and, and, and been spearfishing ventures together and yeah. some of the, you know, actually one of the best spearfishing adventures, you know, ever. I went away with him up to the Brolis um, and uh, um, oh, I forgot the next uh, headland further up from there but... Um, Dirk Hartov Island. Oh, oh, I'm going over there in October for the we, first time. So. We loaded a formula, literally yeah. the whole deck of a formula with fish, with <laughs> four people. I mean, I, I couldn't – you couldn't count the, the Spanish, the the snapper, the fish. That that was just incredible. But yeah. but he's a – you know, he's an incredible diver and he, and he does some things that, you know, you'd scratch your head, you know, like especially with sharks. Like anyway. But I've had fun – I've had fun with lots of people, you know, and learnt from a lot of people as well. 
You know, you, that's what that's what you do when you spend time with people. I'm loving it. I'm doing it myself. I've travelled down the east coast and diving with legends and <clears throat> people that have been listening to the podcast for years. It's an absolute pleasure. There's some great spearfishing people in our community, so I, I relate to that. Yeah. Um, f- but le- before I ask you about sharks and we we open it up the questions, um, what does a spearfishing ex- experience mean to you in sort of one or two sentences these days? Th- these days. Um, just an opportunity to get out there with friends and and and, and just enjoy the, the time in the water. You know, I, I, it's for me the competition. You know, you, you still have a a spirit of in the competition because you, you want to compete against your mate and you want to compete as an older guy. You want to compete against the younger guys too. Um, but you know, it's just generally catching up with people and and then then talking with everybody. You know what I mean? Like young people and that. But as I said, any chance I can get a chance to talk with a younger guy that wants to ask about spearfishing is a good opportunity because, you know, they're all the future spearfishing. You know, they're all the up-and-comings, but but they've got to be safe. You know? I'm glad there's blokes like you around talking to people like me and sharing your wisdom and your your lessons learned and thanks for representing uh, Australia for so many times and doing so well and, and oh. being an example for the rest oh, of us. No, no, no thanks. I'm, mm. yeah, I'm humbled. I'm yeah. humbled. Um, we we started talking about this the shark situation now. Um, a lot of Sydney <coughs> diving has been marked by a recent event. Uh, yeah. An ocean swimmer was was eaten alive off a headland. There's, we can't make any bones about it. That shark wasn't a mistaken identity. It ate that bloke alive and yeah. left very little of him to go. I think it's affected the community here in a big way. Yeah. Um, what are your sort of thoughts and sentiment about it? Has it changed diving for you? And what, what, where do we go to from here sort of thing? Well, it has, a, it has changed diving. I mean, I've had my altercations with whites and that over many years. And, and, um, and I see, you know, I mean, you see the changes. There's just a lot more in the water than, than there used to be. Um, yeah, look, what do you do about it? I don't know. I mean, you know, they're targeting the smaller... Um, whites for tagging and release, they're not getting the big ones that are the culprits. Um, it's easy to catch the small great whites, but mm. to catch a big great white, you know, you need you need the right the right people and the and the right um, gear to do things like that. Back in the day, there was a lot of conversation about rogue great whites with the potential to be man eaters, and they would habitually potentially do it. Yeah. Um, some people have, have talked about that with this particular shark. Some people have hazarded a guess that it's been caught. I know Manny's had a bit of a personal experience possibly with the same shark. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? I, I don't know about a, gra- a rogue great white and that. I just know, just my feeling is that if you've got a, a large shark that's, you know, that there's someone's, it's taken someone's life, I mean, it's, and they say it's an, an accidental um, shark attack. You know, I don't really believe that, um, but I think the government need to spend time to try and take that particular shark out, whether whether they locate it or not. I mean, I don't know. I mean, they've got to catch it first. Um, they can decide if it's the right animal by size or whatever, and then release it. But but when you're talking about animals, you know, three and a half, four and a half meters, you know, you generally got a good idea that in that area that this is the animal and and these animals aren't just to me they're not just passing by they're there there's a certain time of the year that these animals are around Come and i no just just a certain time of the year I, i've known this and we've had many many sightings in from wollongong uh all the way up and to to bondi you know we've had many many great white sightings um and people i mean i've had two incidents myself in in uh, botany, uh, sorry, in off port hacking, with great whites, and um, and they're just they're just prevalent from October through to about February. And generally, Feb- February, the old days, February used to be warm water. You know what I mean? But we seem to be getting colder water around December, January, and so they seem to be hanging around a lot more. Now, you say the whales, but there are other, other factors. I've lived in that port hacking area all my life and I've seen lots of things change. Um, but seals are more prevalent now than ever before. Ah, right. I mean, 
you, you know, once upon a time you could go down the coast and, you know, you knew what areas like the, you know, one of the islands off Wollongong, you know, knew that area 30 years ago, there'd be a few seals hanging off there. Um, Montague Island, you know, you see a few hanging off there. But most places now along the coastline have got seals and they're not just hanging in the ocean and, and, uh, and on the outer coastline, they're in the estuaries mm. and they're following fish in the estuaries. And I mean, it's not uncommon to see seals um, in many of our estuaries. So, so there's something. So something's changed. Source. Yeah, they've got a food source that's readily available. Yeah, so something's changed there. But, but you know, as well as everybody, the reason you know that we've had a large um, change in in, in uh, sightings of great whites is because you know they can't catch them, and 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 it's the same as the grey nurse. We we've never. I mean, I've never known in my years of diving, people shooting great n- n- nurse um, for the fun of it or whatever. I mean, we've seen them for so many years, but up until the late 70s, they sort of slowly, sort of the late 70s to the 80s, they were slowly disappearing. And I mean, the commercial fishing industry was probably ha- had a little bit to do with that. And now they've come back, they're everywhere. Oh. I mean, you see them up on the reef. Oh, I was up in Brisbane like a month ago with a mate and he was diving in a place that's nowhere near a sanctuary or anything like that. Yeah. And I saw two two-metre grey nurse just off him and then I looked around, oh, there's another one, there's another one. He yeah. had seven all over two metres, all just surrounding him. And, yeah. he, and he said there was a big coronation trout there, but you got seven grey nurse hanging out. Um, I, yeah. I, I think he still would have taken the shot, but he just didn't get it. Yeah. But um, they're definitely there in numbers. And, I mean, it, it, it's good to see a healthy shark population, but sometimes we get an imbalance the other way and no one wants to talk about it or admit no. it. Um, some people think sharks are worth more than people, I think. Um, yeah. I get it. I get the concern. Like everyone understands, we understand nature and apex predators and the yeah. need for them in our environment. But I think sometimes we're there to correct an imbalance. I think perception skewed so far in the other direction now that yeah. you know there's no real commercial shark fishery off the east coast of Australia anymore. I think it's down to two thousand kilos of shark meat a year. Yeah, like you used to buy it in every fish and chip shop when uh, when you were younger. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. No, look, you hear it all the time. You know. We're in their environment. Well, we're in, you know, we're on land and we're in many um, animals, including us, as yeah. in their environment. You know, crocodiles and and kangaroos that, you know, all different things that, that can affect um, someone's life. And we just happen to be, you know, most of Australians love the water. But if these animals are, um, you know, they're patrolling our beaches, which, um, you know, I mean, I know... The, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me that a four, a three and a half to four and a half metre wide is just swimming along the beaches looking after, looking for salmon and, and tailor and things no. like that. It just, you know, and they just happen to be passing by, you know. It, it's just too many sightings and, and too many incidents, you know what I mean? So, you know, my, my I mean, I had, most of my incidents were in the 80s, mm. um, only one in the 90s and and the last one was four years ago in in in, uh, in a year or two before manuals, you know. So, um, and that, and I've known many other divers that have that have had you know confrontations with great whites, whether they've approached them or or come up and they're right in front of them, and or come off the bottom at them, and you know. I'm conscious of time, Gunther. One last no question for me about the shark thing, yeah. and I know it's a big topic, and we're not experts, There's, but we do spend no. a lot. The guys like you spend a lot of time in the water, so you have it an opinion that has been informed by experience. Um, a lot of Sydney guys are gun shy about getting back in the water. Yeah. What, what do you say to people? How do you rationalise the fear? How do you still enjoy this lifestyle and still feel safe in the water? Look, look they've, got, they've got good reason to be um, a bit shy nowadays, but I, I, I would just say, look, generally get out there when it's nice, clean water. I, I don't think in, in our areas now you want to be fishing in, you know, in dirty water. You know what I mean? Like in less than two metres. Of... So we're going to have to wait a couple of weeks. Oh, look, I, I, look, I don't want to stop people from, from spearfishing, but it's, you know, dirty water's not, not a great great thing, you know, to be diving in. But get out there, dive clean water, and uh, just be cautious in those months of, you know, November through to February, you know, that... that uh, I, I, I used to think that these big... They're big females that are hanging around and they give birth, and then, then they talk about... Places like up at Newcastle where there's a lot of young, and I mean I've been I've worked up at Crowdy Head and I've had a young two metre white, you know, come right up to the boat, and I've been at, at Foster, uh, 
Port Macquarie and the same thing happened there. Um, you know, there's, and that's, you know, certain times of the year. Um, and I, I just wonder whether these big, these big animals are coming up at, um, in that period between November or December through to February. But it's so. just, it's just a sur sur surmising that, you know, because I've seen mine at, always around that time and most people I talk to see them around that time so okay. just be a bit weary of that that and, and make sure you you know you've got a bit of visibility even though I know we don't we just tend to go out there but but um we just want to and, get a feed and yeah get in the water and, and relax and get away from yeah I, I, I like Sydney I, I like the look of it but I can tell it's a busy place and yeah like this lifestyle we all lead like um it's hectic and it's so good to get your face in the water and just yeah, forget look, about everything else for a little while. The numbers games, you know, like, I mean, you know, how many people are swimming, how many people are diving. I mean, they're right. I mean, it's only been one attack in, in so long and so forth. But I actually, I've been saying it for a while that it's only a matter of time. Some one of the, you know, these swimmers or that ocean swimmers and that are, you know, there's going to be an incident soon. You know, Manny asked me to go out and be his dive buddy. He thinks that the fatter and slower dive buddies get eaten first. <laughs> yeah. So he asked me to go diving yeah. with him. Do you think buddying up um, reduces your chances of getting eaten? And do you oh, look, it just it just makes you feel more relaxed, you know, in the water and, and doing that. And it's not a bad thing because, you know, you're, you're enjoying your time with somebody and then, if, you know, if um, something goes wrong, there's somebody there to help you. You know, especially if something major goes wrong, you need someone to help you Perfect. get to shore or get back to the boat. Salt and water make for a deadly combination when it comes to dive gear. That's why you need to visit oldmanblue.com.au. They use the finest in materials and they make stuff to last. They use 316 marine grade stainless steel in their loops and they source their materials and make their own stuff right there in Western Australia. Catch bags, cray loops and more. Visit oldmanblue.com.au. Check it out. Great news guys, Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one, there's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com, get Adam's course and use the code Spiro to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of killing dried Burmese teak. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American-made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at KillShotSpearGuns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at KillShotSpearGuns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at KillShotSpearGuns.com. Gunther, I've had an absolute ball, mate. I do want to open up the questions to the rest of the, <coughs> the people here. I don't know if we've had any ladies join us, but uh, no, we've had no, so it's all blokes, so I can use my gendered language. That's fantastic. Um, guys, any questions out there? Any volunteers? Here we go. Thanks, Shrek. I uh, love your show, mate. Uh, Thanks, Gunther. Appreciate the time Thank tonight, much. mate. Um, just got a question. Um, what's your most enjoyable or challenging species to target and what makes them so enjoyable slash challenging? challenging? Uh, well, I suppose there's a few, but, um, I mean, every diver would love to get a snapper. I mean, and it's harder to get a, a good snapper in, in, you know, in New South Wales. I mean, we go to New Zealand, we know there's a good chance we're going to get a snapper. A snapper has always been... Uh, a fish that most divers want to get one of, you know, and and I found, you know, all my years of diving, I've always enjoyed, you know, looking for snapper and and that. But I've I've never, I, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I don't get a lot of them, but uh, it used to be Mulloway, but um, the Mulloway, you know, the commercial guys have really made a an impact on the Mulloway, and and it's something that I. I feel that they've got a, the government you know, fisheries have got to do something about. Uh, it was only it was only two years ago. My son was down 
in Jarvis Bay there at the entrance to um, – no, it wasn't Jarvis Bay. It was just on Husk, uh, Vincentia. No, not Vincentia. What's the – what's the – just Sussex. And there was a commercial fishing crew there and apparently it was – they said it was an incidental catch and they caught about two tonne of Mulloway up to 35 kilos. Oh, oh. And, and I – don't really believe that. Um, it was in um, it was December, and those fish in the high tide, the king tides, they'll come out, and they got targeted. And I've got video footage and photography footage from my son, and I've given that to the fisheries department, and that was sorted, that was looked into. And in, in Eden, there was the same thing: a commercial vessel circled, which they thought was salmon and all that. But again, you know, a huge. School of Mulloway. Um, Inshore and undersize is a complaint I hear about the commercial boys. I mean, a lot of Spiros can be commercial fishermen and yeah. we're not against commercials. No, we're, no, we're not. I, 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 every, it's everyone's livelihood and, and you give them some, some credit of the doubt that, that, that they, it wasn't an accident that they circled the fish and, and, and brought it up, you know. But, but, gee, in shallow water, you get a rough idea. Um, first of all, how did they work out that they were there did they use a drone or did someone spot them from a headland or so and and you know a school of salmon you can you know every every spear fisherman when he's traveling in a boat and looks over can see a school of salmon but a school of mulloway up to 35 kilos but different. um yeah a little bit different and that's unfortunate so i yeah I, I mean, lanini and all this rain apparently is going to be good for the mulloway your I, thoughts on that i i don't know i'm not a, I, i'm not a a marine really, biologist. No, I'm not really up there. I mean, I, I got my only – last time I got a mull away was two years ago and it was only eight, seven, eight kilos and it was with a manual. It was only a little one. And um, and it was sad to just only see small ones. And I liked and how that. you answered his question. You talked about snapper and gave him no information about how to hunt him. Other than, other other than, go, other to New than go to New Zealand. Go to New Zealand. <laughs> You're destined to get one in New Zealand. Uh, yeah, there but, are some crackers over there, aren't there? Top there, of the North Island particularly. Yeah, there yeah. is. And that's a great place to dive. I mean, yeah. aw- awesome place to dive. But, yeah, look, the, the, there's lots of fish, you know what I mean? Like I used to – Leading up to the time I got that Maori wrasse, I used to think one day I'm going to get one of those big Maori wrasse and I regret it. You know, I just, I, I regret killing that fish. No, it sounds ridiculous, but, you know, I've let up, I've got little ones that you eat, 10, 15 kilos. Um, but I just always thought one day I'm going out to the Coral Sea, I'm going to get myself a big Maori wrasse. And so, uh, yeah. Disappointing. But, um, that's a that's a funny yeah. It one. was, but it took, but you know, if ever I, I mean, I know it wasn't bad. It wasn't good for me to, to say that most divers, most good divers, don't shoot Maori wrasse. Well, you know, it wasn't a nice thing that you know, but it was the only one I ever did. I mean, my other friends would I always used to go out and try to get a big one and that. But um, I'm glad that I'm glad that the, the, you know the like some in some ways the big ones are off the list. I mean, there's it's a pretty common fish nowadays just like our blue groper um you know it'd be nice to just make a limit you know one fish per diver and, and marry ras to be under under the 15 20 kilos if you want one you know but to leave the big ones alone and that but you know i just don't know i mean i it's hard to make the rules and and change this is like big trout big flathead but uh I, one fish i think need two fish i think really need being looked after on our coastline and that's the bandit moong and the Mulloway. They're two species that are really, really in danger. Um, you need a slot size? Sorry? That's a shit staring question, that yeah. one. Yeah, no, no, just a limit. A limit, you know, a limit per take, per, per person, per boat. That's, got, yeah, that's where it's got to be at. Okay. The Bandit Moong have just, they've just copped the flogging. You know, yeah. we used to get them out here. Now, Sorry about that. That's probably the Noob Spirit podcast influence there. Yeah. yeah. Just so anyway, talking up the Moe. Yeah, anyway. Um, every, sorry, every, yeah, all good. Um, guys, any more questions out here? There we go. It's got a port hacking bloke. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah, Gunter, um, you've been diving for many years, 49 years, I think you said. Um, spearfishing. Spearfishing, yeah. 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 Um, Sorry. What, what, um, like what, what's your thoughts on fish back in the day, back then, compared to now? Is, it, is there more fish? Was there more fish back then? Um, See, 
in the seventies, we used to have all the sewers, the sewer outlets, um, on most headlands, and I don't know whether it was an attraction for fish, um, but they used to be, they used to be just so many species of fish and and, and so much fish at that time, um, probably because of whatever food out. But but the fish weren't. They really weren't that good to eat, and I mean, if you're eating and you you took took a risk, you know, but but um, yeah, look, uh, there are species like there are species that you just don't get anymore. John Dory is one of them. Um, the seventies, you could get a John Dory. The sixties, oh, John Dory. You could, I could spear John Dory off the Bundina Wharf or Cronulla Wharf with a hand spear. I could hook them. You know, they, they were just a, a common fish. But Beautiful eating. By the, by, yeah, but by the uh, 80s and 90s, they just started disappearing, and now you just don't see them. I mean, I, I haven't seen one. You know, I know you get them in New Zealand, but that's another a fish that have just disappeared as well as, you know. Apart from those two species you mentioned, is New South Wales doing a good job managing the fishery? Oh, gee, I mean... Oh, that's that's a hard one. It's I a mean, big, I'm, terrible question. That's the other ones I like to ask. Yeah, look, they're managing our industry, the abalone industry, and the urchin industry. You know, pretty good at the moment. Um, we'd like a few more changes in the urchin industry. We'd like a, you know a few more reductions and and that. I mean, I, I'm not for me to to talk about the lobster industry and that. I mean, that's that's that industry's gotten better. Yeah, and and they've allowed I think an extra lobster or yeah. whatever. The abalone industry, you know, I mean, definitely in these areas. I mean, there's no commercial quantity much anymore. You know, it's all pretty much down south. Um, so we we're constantly sort of chasing the limitations and and the sustainability of our industry. Mm. So we're we're putting our sizes up um, against the sizes that you guys the public are allowed to take, so we're taking a bigger size. Um, so, yeah, look, they're doing a good job. With the fish, the fishing industry, I don't really know. As I said, those yeah. few fish, the one thing that they did, and and it was fantastic for all of us, was that in the 90s or the end of the 90s, I think they stopped the cage kingfish traps. Yeah. That was the best thing that they'd, they'd done. Okay. That, that was terrific because now you, we're seeing the benefits we're starting to see large schools of kingfish and, and we're seeing big kingfish again, you know. So we used to see kingies 30, 40 kilos in the 70s, um, you know, off, off Karong on the on the, on the shoal, the shoals that were out there. You know, you, for years we never used to see them and, and now they're slowly coming back. So they did a good thing there. Un, look, I mean, it's unfortunate for the, for the commercial guys, but the commercial guys right now are doing pretty good yeah, handlining yeah. them. I mean, it's not, nothing to see 30, 40 boats off uh, Montague Island catching kingfish. Sometimes I see sparrows and they have a long-term orientation. They see the fishery in terms of what's it going to be like in 40 years. Yeah. It's great to hear some success stories yep. with the eastern rock lobster. Great, great. We, we need more of that. Yep. Sometimes it means us giving something so that we get something hopefully in the future. Yep. Uh, it's good you've you've seen some of those things take place. Yeah, but always work to be done. I think. Yeah, well, one of the one of the worst ones that I'd seen was when I was in Tasmania. There was a fish called an orange ruffy, and it was like, it was just like um, the gold rush. There were bo- blokes bringing boats in from everywhere and and getting a, a deep sea commercial trawl license, and and in the eighties they were going out there and and uh, catching, you know. 100 tonne of these species, of old species of fish. And it went for, I don't know how many years, until they worked out that, you know, that the industry was declining. Yeah. But the main reason I think they they uh, they saw a problem with it was that once, if you were a, a large vessel and you had like a, a 200 tonne, 2,000 tonne quota, and you were on the last part of your quota and you had 300 tonne to catch, and you hauled in 400 tonnes, well, they they just let go of 100 tonnes of fish and it was just floating on the surface. Oh, yeah. And, and that was just criminal. And, yeah. and that's where it ended up getting to. And then, uh, I don't know to what extent, you know, whether it was 85, 86, um, the industry came to a head and uh, the, the fisheries saw the problem with it and, and they'd solved that issue. 
cool. So yeah, you need a you need a, um, a an impact to sort of you know get people's attention. So, Patience and persistence. Yeah. Sometimes Spiros can be guilty of apathy, yeah. not getting involved because it's just <coughs> too hard. Um, whether it's signing petitions or getting involved in a citizen science project or yeah. just so- signing up with your local club and, and being actively involved and, and having a say because we spend more time in the ocean than most users and we arguably see more. So yeah. we need to be part of that process. Yeah, so, so we're fortunate that we can get certain species of fish that fishermen can't get. So we target... You know, like we've got our leather jackets and, and we've got our, you know, two of our moong that they don't catch and we've got, you know, quite a few species that, that we can we can get that fishermen can't get. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, and that, that's that's a benefit to us. But there hasn't been a real lot of change in, in the, you know, the habitat species, you know, the, 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 the drummers and the ludric and the brim and the, you know, the leather jackets and all those things. They still seem to still be pretty healthy. Awesome. It's 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 the other species that that gets targeted and mm. and um, and I found that to be the jewfish, the red, the, the mulloway, and uh, sorry, the jewfish, the bandit moong, mm. and of course the one that's pretty much extinct now is the John Dory on our coastline. You know, so awesome so, question, yeah. um, fellas. Have we got another one out here? Yeah. Uh, okay, far away. Come up and grab the mic, there, please. Hey, come up. The twelve-inch okay. prangers that you were talking about. Yeah, where did you get them from? <coughs> I'm not sure where I got them. All I know is that I don't know exactly where I got it. Someone had made a base, or and someone had made the the, the, the spear barb. So I don't really know. But but you can make it. All you need is the thread. I mean, Gary makes just about anything out of uh, out of metal and and I used to have a, you know in the older days when I was fishing with with Rudy Feinbar he used to make things for me that that you couldn't buy sorry that you couldn't buy and and then um, I think to be honest with you I'm not real sure where I got it I know it was a homemade pranger but the, but the base was a lot lot thicker because it had to hold thicker thicker sharp, uh, pranger barbs and they were they were 12 inches long and man you had to have obviously a powerful gun to penetrate, but when I hit that dog tooth tuna with it, it just didn't move. It it just it just went must have went in six or eight inches, and you had to virtually operate to get that thing out. You, you couldn't pull it out. You Guys, know. I'm having a ball. I reckon we got time for two more, and then we'll have to take this off air and have a few beers. I saw a question over here. The bloke with the oh, <coughs> I was going to make a comment about the man, but. <laughs> Cheers, Jack. Sorry, brother. No, you're all right, mate. Uh, nice to meet you, Gunter. Um, you mentioned earlier you rock a two-weight system. Yeah. Do you do you have any other equipment systems that you prefer over sort of more basic entry-level setups? Um, I mean, the the standard system for a rig cord is is a, if you've seen this in competitions is the speed rig, which is the shaft. That's at the end of a of a cable that you connect to your gun, so that what that does is when you're spearfishing, you can shoot a fish, push it through the gills, clip it back on your gun, push it off the spear, let your spear dangle down, and then the fish just drift, drift down the line. So so that's always been a a good thing for all spear fishermen to get the fish away from you and and um, yeah, um, but outside of that, I, I mean, I I always like I I think I got the knife put on my chest because it was easy to access to actually stab larger prey like Spanish mackerel, wahoo and tuna and stuff like that. And so that and, – and having that weight belt as a commercial abalone diver, it felt comfortable for me. But then I realised that, you know, it, it had to be light for me for spearfishing to actually benefit from a problem that could arise from a deep, a deep dive. So letting go of your – yeah – Sorry, yeah. Craig's brought you over a speed spike and a bit of a rig line there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the fundamentals of any young fellow or anyone spearfishing that a line like that with a speed rig, learning how to use it and a float. You know, it, it's it's. Are you a fan of up through the gills and through the mouth, or are you a double eye man? No, I, I always through the gills and straight out the mouth. Yeah. Flo- it runs back to the fish really yeah, right. quick. Yep. Um, if you go through the eyes, if you've got a knot in your line, it'll stop somewhere at the knot. So it's best to go through the mouth and then you know run run to the end. That's just my yeah. No, nah, it's yeah, good. It's so. good. Duskies though. 
dusky whalers, they like that sort of carry on. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, they no. all like it, but seals like it. <laughs> Lately, the seals are liking it a lot yeah, more. Yeah, right. Than, uh, yeah, than that. They're but, scared, just as scary as the bloody sharks. Yeah, yeah. No, they, 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 the silent. Uh, they approach you silently. Those. Are you talking about grey nurse? Yeah. Oh, I was talking oh, about dusky whalers. Oh, or any yeah, other whaler yeah, species. yeah. No, the, the yeah. silent grey nurse. He comes up ever so gracefully and just about. You can touch him on the nose. Yeah. With uh, whalers are always a bit more you know, quicker and aggressive and and, and, and posture get, up a bit. Yeah, and they and they run away quick. You know. All right. I got one last question. I got Josh Bollin over the back corner there. He's been bugging me for the since the last one. So, Josh. <coughs> Sorry, Gus. No, it was just a question about the prangers. Um, doesn't sound like it held you back at all. But were you ever worried about you know like losing a few kilos of meat, hitting them with the pranger, especially in competitions and stuff? Uh yeah, Josh. Yeah. You do, but look, in time, it's like anything, you, you, you get to, you know, I mean, I, I can't shoot a, a fish in the eye or a, a kill shot with a straight through, you know, spear where most of you guys can probably do that, where I'm not that good at it, but I've, all I've done is use the pranger, so I'm used to it. So I, I always aim for the head and generally, you know, either side of the eye, you're generally going to get a, a kill shot. So I don't really have too many where I've damaged the flesh. Um, yeah, so Josh is a bit of a he's a bit of a chef. He's a garage chef, yep. like many of us. Yep. But he's got a bloody gift for it and a talent for it. If anyone wants to check out some good recipes. Yeah, I know, awesome. He submitted a bunch for ninety nine spare recipes. Um Gunther, I've had an absolute pleasure. We've run away oh, with the time. Yeah, yeah. We can talk about stuff for hours, mate. And uh yeah. you've got a lot of a lot of stories and a lot of wisdom for us all, so Thanks for coming in and bloody doing this thing. It's been awesome. Yeah, no, thank you very much. It's yeah, it's been a pleasure. I'm very humbled <laughs> by it. Mate, I, by hope it, sp- I, don't, yeah. I hope you're spearing into your 80s and dragging Manny out and letting him <laughs> letting him be the shark bait because he couldn't kick con me to get out there with him. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed today's episode. Gunther, an absolute gentleman and a living legend. 60 years sending it. Absolutely uh, gobsmacking some of his stories. Really enjoyed it. Hey, next week it's episode 200. Huge milestone. A massive feather in the cap for Noob Spiro. It's, it's been eight years in the making to get here. It's a huge community episode uh, with a where are they now from former guests and voice messages from legends just like you who listen to the podcast. Go to noobspiro.com, head up into the Nooba Stories menu tab and leave me a voice message. One to two minutes would be perfect to include in that podcast and uh, just celebrate getting to 200. More than a million downloads in more than 100 countries over eight years and just frothing legends from all over the planet have chatted with me all things spearfishing and shared their poo stories because you know it's my favourite but anyway if you love the podcast consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash noobspero join more than 50 people sending me on trips just like the one I've been on the east coast tour I hope you enjoyed all five interviews and uh, some special ones coming up including uh, top 20 YouTube channels with James Sacker coming up in the early 200s and uh, oh who else have I got Captain Aaron Young oh I really enjoyed that so come back next week subscribe tell your mates about it thanks for listening all good trick over and out today's episode was an absolute banger and so is our major sponsor Adreno visit them at adreno.com.au they have a huge range of equipment and you can find it at adreno.com.au use the code noobspiro at checkout when you shop online you can save $20 on every purchase over 200 you can even use that code in store at some of their huge mega stores Australia wide price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price again visit them at adreno.com.au use the code noobspiro I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but oorah! When I say the words neptonics.com, I automatically want to say it. It is solid gear that works. It's the very best of spearing equipment and components from around the planet. Visit neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code noob10 to save 10% off.